<laughs> I'm going to light incense because it's not going to bother anyone. Okay. How many are we? We are 13. I feel like there should be more. Hi, good morning. Hey, Anta. Okay. We're going to start with uh, the verses. So if you want to get yourself ready with the verses and uh, Nomi is going to lead the motivation. Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, the verse I chose is verse 16. Even if a person for whom you're cared like your own child regards you as an enemy, cherish him specially like a mother does her child who is stricken by sickness. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. I'll read it also in Hebrew. Kasher mishu shukarta vehavta ke yaldecha, mafnelcha et gabo veroe becha oyev, lehovoto af yoter, ke ima ohevet et yelda hole, ze tergul shel yeldea buddha. Thank you. That one's lovely. Um, so today we're going to start with looking at the verses um, and number 11. So um, I think page two at the bottom of the page. So uh, continuing to revive our bodhicitta. Um, verse 10 is um, under the head. It's the first verse that is officially the bodhisattva path. All of the verses that came before are preliminaries related to the preliminaries, small scope and me medium scope. Now we're into the great scope for the whole rest of the text. Um, and so this verse, verse 10 is about um, aspiring bodhicitta. Verse 11 is about engaging bodhicitta. So I'll just read them to you for a second. Number 10 says, when your mothers who you've loved, who've loved you since time without beginning, are suffering, what is the use of your own happiness? Therefore, to free limitless living beings, develop the altruistic intention. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. All suffering comes from the wish for your own happiness. Perfect Buddhas are born from the thought to help others. Therefore, exchange your own happiness for the suffering of others. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So these two verses are really easily misunderstood, really, really easily misunderstood. Basically, the first one, um, 10, is talking about why to do the equalizing and exchanging self for others practice. Verse 11 is saying how. So there's why and then there's how. So the why is, is remembering, you know, sevenfold cause and effect that you guys have talked about before, remembering that all sentient beings have been your mothers, remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness, love, compassion, highest intention, leading to bodhicitta. 
So the sevenfold cause and effect, um, you know, does definitely rely on some belief in past and future lives and an understanding of beginningless time. And so again, if that one has never sat with you well, you can also think of the beginningless ancestors, right? Repaying the kindness of your ancestors and having um, lived, you know, worked, struggled, joys, sorrows, all leading into this person you are today. How can you repay the kindness of all of their lives by having a meaningful life now? Um, and so when you're thinking about all sentient beings as having been your mothers, you can think of it in those terms, but what you're really trying to do is to see the sentient beings in your immediate life as family. So to brand everyone as family means that there's a certain amount of mental space with um, if they're misbehaving. You can give up on strangers who misbehave. You can't really give up on family unless it's an extreme case. Yeah, your family members, you know, you love them at the baseline, and then they do things that you appreciate and things you don't appreciate. But when they do things that you don't appreciate, you don't write them off, usually, right? Except in extreme cases. And so Lama Yeshi would call this the family feeling or the family feeling is what we're trying to get um, this sense with all sentient beings of just their family, everybody's family and it gets rid of us and them thinking. So this is why you would want to equalize and exchange yourself for others, because this is your family and you want them to be well. How to do it is then the next verse, which is basically to remember that it hasn't helped to strive for your own happiness alone. It hasn't been effective. In fact, it's actually led to your own suffering. And what we're talking about here is not striving for normal happiness like basic needs. Basic needs, absolutely, we need to get under control and organized. You know, we need food and shelter and, you know, affection. These sorts of things are, um, you know, basic human needs. And that's not what's being talked about. We're talking about the self-cherishing thought that is always hungry. The self-cherishing thought that's always hungry for your own happiness and gets into this really, you know, narrow focus of what will feed me feed all of my senses, stimulate me, keep me up. Um, because when you get into that, one, because it's driven by attachment, it will never be enough. Two, when you're in that space, you become very self-centered and disregard the needs of others, even if you don't even mean to. You're just so self-centered, you don't realize the impact of your actions on other people. So it's, when it says striving for your own happiness, um, it is the cause of suffering. It's not saying striving for the happiness of basic needs or striving for the happiness of full enlightenment. Yeah, we need to strive for the happiness of basic needs. We need to strive for the happiness of enlightenment. That kind of striving is completely good and rational. What it's saying here is the happiness that self-cherishing thinks it needs. Does that make sense? So this verse is really needs commentary because if you just read it on its own, it's like, what do you mean, <laughs> right? I'm bad for wanting happiness? No, the point of Buddhism is happiness, right? Your happiness, everyone's happiness, that's the whole point. But self-cherishing says, I'm helping you, and it's not, right? It's not, it just gets you into this like Pac-Man mode, you know, you know this like video game from the 80s that goes and you just eat everything, All right? It's just, it's never enough. It's never enough when it's born from attachment. So um, when you look at the verse 10 about why, um, when your mothers who, who've loved you since time without beginning are suffering, what use is your own happiness? Of course, your own happiness has a use. If you're well and happy and content, you're more functional and able to be of benefit. What it's saying is striving for. Yeah, striving for the happiness born from self-cherishing, that hungry one. Um, and it's kind of like, if you're, it's a bit like now where a lot of us are able to work from home 
and we're relatively comfortable and it's, you know, it's a, probably a little bit of a pain to have everybody in the house all day and there's issues with the neighbors and, you know, you guys probably have a lot more stress happening in your household than I do, but you know, my neighbors, everyone is home. And so um, that means occasionally the power goes out because the grid gets overloaded. And um, it means that there's, you know, various um, noises that there aren't usually and, you know, there's, um, kind of a paranoia when I'm walking around the neighborhood um, where people who normally would give me a hug or wave, they're sort of like a little paranoid and, you know, looking away and, you know, it's the social distancing thing is making people a little bit weird. Yeah, it's making people kind of weird. So I don't have kids in my house all the day, you know, which sort of makes life less distracting. But, you know, there are things that um, are hard, but generally speaking, life is pretty easy right now. Yeah, I'm just home doing my job, having a snack, <laughs> you know, doing my practice. And, and, it's, and I think, what is the use of this comfort unless I'm using it for my spiritual path? I could just treat it like this endless holiday. Yeah, and you know, but if you, you know, if any of us were sort of um, with this kind of freedom and this kind of um, ordinary happiness, but you know you're surrounded by people that are actually really stressed out, it feels kind of um, inappropriate to just kind of bask in indulgence if everyone around you is suffering. Doesn't it, you know, it feels kind of like, oh, that's a bit dodgy, yeah? It doesn't mean you can't enjoy the fact that you have resources or enjoy the fact that you have space and free time. It's like, please enjoy that, be nourished by that so that then you can radiate outward to all the stressed people all around us, some sort of peace. But if I just kind of like hoard it, you know, if I hoard my peace the way, you know, Americans are hoarding toilet paper, then, you know, then it actually makes me more and more insular and more and more paranoid and actually, um, it doesn't give me more happiness. It actually stifles the happiness. So even if I never leave the house, if I think, may I share the peace I have in this little apartment by radiating it out, then, then I'm making the best use of the fact that I have ordinary happiness right now. It doesn't become an inappropriate use of it. So none of this is saying don't enjoy your life. This is saying enjoy your life even more and don't kind of like suffocate or trap your happiness by hoarding it. Yeah, that's really what this teaching is about. Don't suffocate your happiness by hoarding it. Don't um, batten down the hatches and lock all the doors and close up shop in this kind of psychological way with this kind of like edgy neediness of me first because it's not gonna end well, yeah? It doesn't mean don't look after your basic needs. It doesn't mean enjoy having some extra time. Oh, please do. Um, do. Do you get the distinction though? It's, it's a really important distinction because I think if you remember times that you've hoarded happiness, um, it seems like a functional thing to do until something like, quote, intrudes. Then your reaction to the intrusion is way out of proportion to what your normal rational mind would do. So if you, you know, if you don't notice that you've gotten into a self-cherishing way of thinking, a really strong self-cherishing way of thinking, you could be having a relatively relaxed, happy, entertained day. But then if like just something very simple, like the phone rings, you're like annoyed. Yeah, just some very minor inter interruption or this, there's a knock at the door or someone wants to come into your office or you know, some minor intrusion that if you were not in such a self-cherishing place, you just pick it up and be like, hey, okay. You know, it would just be in the flow. Self-cherishing feels like there's invaders. Yeah, invaders that are gonna come and take your happiness. That's the way you get when you're in self-cherishing. When you're in cherishing others, it's like none of this belongs to me anyway. Of course I'm gonna share it. And there's a much easier flow and your heart is settled and open. Yeah, and so then it doesn't feel like you're being invaded. Do you, do you know what I mean? Do you have thoughts about that? So it's of course perfectly natural to feel, you know, intruded upon or invaded when you're just trying to get the job done and there's a lot of distractions. But if you can remember those days when you've been 
in a sharing mood. Yeah, when your heart has been in a really expansive mood, it's almost, it's, it's almost a higher happiness to share than it was to just enjoy things on your own. Yeah, um, you know, I was thinking about how um, uh, my folks and I went to this uh, outdoor concert last summer, um, Shakespeare in the Parks. And um, we had our, everyone comes a little early to put down their blanket so that you have the, a, a good position to see the stage and to see the Shakespeare play. And um, people get a little bit self-cherishing with like their blanket placement. You know, they're like, this is where I'm sitting. Nobody better get there. And the borders are very clearly defined with like, you know, like bottles of wine and like coolers of sandwiches and like, you're like staking out your claim, right? And um, if there's lots of space, people are very relaxed about this process. And if it gets crowded, people get more and more grumpy. Even though we're all just coming to a free thing, you know, in the summer and it's beautiful everywhere and everyone's gonna be able to hear their speakers. And yet there's this like tightness, right? And um, so I was there with my parents and we'd had a really relaxed day and we'd just been um, kind of without a tight schedule. And so all three of us were in a really relaxed mood. So we, we staked our claim, we got our blanket and we were having our snacks and um, then a, a couple came and they they were late and there was only this tiny little bit of space next to us and i was so pleased that all of us were just like yeah come share come share with us you know just squeeze in we didn't know them you know they didn't know us um but actually us having to squeeze in and share the space i think made us happier yeah it made us happier to share even though now we all had less space now we were all more crowded and we're still sitting on the ground, you know, and we're not young anymore. Like, it, you know, it's uncomfortable to sit on the cold ground for two hours for a concert, but we were happy to, to squeeze in. And I think that this, this kind of thing shows us that self-cherishing lies. Self-cherishing lies. It says me first makes me more happy. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. So, so if you can think of some example of that in your life where it was not what you would have expected, but it actually sharing and not feeling invaded and expanding the heart actually lifted everyone's level of joy of the whole situation. Use some very ordinary example in your life and then take that as a proof that this is true what is said here. When you're seeking and craving and hungry for your own happiness, Happiness eludes you. When you're thinking of the happiness of others, happiness comes for yourself very easily. Do you, do you agree or um, do you have some experience? Yeah, generally. Okay. So that's, um, those, are, those two are the equalizing and exchanging verses and they're also the bodhicitta of aspiration and the bodhicitta of engagement. So um, I think it's important to see that there are steps. The bodhicitta of aspiration or the intention of bodhicitta is basically saying, I like the idea of bodhicitta, but I don't have it yet. I like the idea of it. It seems like a lovely way to live. I like it. So it lives in aspiration. And letting it live in aspiration builds power for you to actually do it. Um, in Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, it says it's like the difference between planning to go and actually going. Like planning a trip and actually setting off onto the trip. The planning is an essential part, you know, the gathering of resources and the thinking about it. That, that's all a huge piece of it. And so we don't want to look down on ourselves in the planning stage. You know, we don't want to look down on ourselves if it's like, you know, all your life you've dreamed of visiting Paris, but you don't have the money yet. So you're saving up and saving up. That saving up is leading to be able to do this thing that you want, right? They're not unrelated. So, um, so this is a really important thing that it's laid out in steps. First, you aspire and you have to live in aspiration for quite a while. And that builds enough momentum internally that you kind of organically go into engagement. You don't have to force it. Yeah, that you aspire long enough with a genuine joy of it and a joy, you know, kind of an inspiration about it, that it tips over into and now I'm actually doing it. Make sense? Okay, so <clears throat> those are the verses for the day. Now we'll um, turn to the joyous effort section again. 
and we'll come back to that outline that's on page 18. We were talking about obstacles to energy on Monday, the, um, the three types of laziness. And um, I think we pretty thoroughly covered um, procrastination and attachment to other activities. Um, and then we were starting to touch on this laziness of despondency. And um, in the Lamrim Chenmo, um, which is you know our Galukpa Holy Grail, <laughs> the Galukpa Holy Grail is, um, it, it's interesting because when you read the section on joyous effort, the um, laziness of attachment to other activities is very short. It's basically like, you know this one. Yeah, the first one and the third one, there's all this elaboration and subdivisions, but the second one, it's like, you guys know this, moving on. Um, so this laziness of despondency, you know, this discouragement, um, this faint heartedness, um, this is a, a natural developmental stage in the spiritual path. Um, you know, it's sometimes Christians would call it the dark night of the soul. I don't know if that exists in Judaism as well. Is there's this concept, the dark night of the soul? It's basically like your existential crisis. Or your, you've practiced long enough to become aware of how much there is to do. In the beginning, you know, you see how much there is to do and it's really inspiring. And, you know, you kind of have this sponge-like ability to remember lots of things and there's an openness and there's, um, I think there's a lot less fear about asking questions when you identify as a beginner. When you identify with this, as a beginner, you're like, why would I know anything? I can ask whatever I want. I'm a smart person. This is just new to me. You know, there's a, there's a real relaxation in your ability to ask questions. And then as soon as you start identifying as an expert or you start identifying as someone who's done this for a while, then your um, ability to ask questions shuts right down because you think you should know better already. You know, your pride kicks in and then blocks your ability to stay in that kind of fresh beginner space. Um, but, you know, aside from that is this like dark night of the soul where you realize there is a vast amount of work to be done for myself and all humanity. How on earth am I going to do this? How about I just get through the day? Yeah, and it's a really natural, it's a completely natural stage. And so in the Lamrim Chenmo, it's actually quite a long section talking about this. And I won't read the whole thing to you, but I thought to, to read a few passages um, from this section. So um, this particular translation, they call the laziness of despondency, um, discouragement or self-contempt, okay? And the way to get rid of it is three sections. So they call it the stopping discouragement about the goal, stopping discouragement about the means to attain the goal, and stopping discouragement because wherever you go is a place to practice. So even the headings to me are quite uplifting. They're uplifting headings. <laughs> Right? Um, and it's this same thing that you see in Buddhism again and again of the human condition in pretty much the same always. Because it's describing, you know, how we are now and we think this is like a modern situation. But no, this has been the, the obstacles for everyone from beginningless time, way before technology, way before the level of busyness we have now. And that's reassuring because that means there are strategies. Yeah, and that it's not like the Buddha, uh, the Buddha Dharma is somehow becoming irrelevant. It's like, no, it's exactly as relevant as it's ever been. Thank goodness, because we have now techniques. So stopping discouragement about the goal. This section is written in a debate structure. And um, it says qualm or question, qualm. If the goal is Buddhahood, the total elimination of all faults and the total completion of all good qualities, then since it's extremely difficult for me to accomplish even a few good qualities or to remove even a few faults, how could someone like me be capable of attaining such a result? Possibly thoughts that we've all had, right? Right here, you know, 14th century, like classic Lamrim, yeah? Reply, if such a sense of discouragement manifests, it's a very great fault because it constitute, it const 
constitutes, excuse me, giving up the spirit of enlightenment. Even if such a thought does not fully manifest, you must stop it at, at its incipient stage. How to stop it? Encourage yourself with this thought. The Bhagawan, the authoritative person who speaks what is true and correct, never what is false or erroneous, said that even flies will attain enlightenment. That being so, why should I not attain it, so long as I do not give up persevering? Inasmuch as human birth gives me an excellent basis and I have mental capacity to analyze what to adopt and what to cast aside. And then he goes on to quote Guide from a Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Um, and so Shanti Deva says, um, even flies, mosquitoes, bees, and worms will attain unsurpassed enlightenment, so hard to attain once they generate the power of perseverance. Why should someone like me, born into a human race, recognizing benefit and harm, not attain enlightenment, as long as I do not give up the bodhisattva deeds, right? So it's, it's, it's reminding us that all sentient beings have Buddha nature, and that if something like a fly or a worm has Buddha nature and will eventually become enlightened, why should I be looking down on myself, who is you know, lucky enough to be a human being who can actually practice? Right? So you're just kind of putting it in some sort of context of what's going to lead to enlightenment is perseverance. Yeah, you've got everything you need. All the ingredients are here. It's just a matter of application. And so, you know, pacing, again, like I said last week, is the key. Knowing how, how much you can do on any given day, not too fast, not too slow, not too tight, not too loose. What's that look like any given day? without looking down on yourself because we're lucky enough not to be a mosquito this time. So um, if we were, we couldn't study. Yeah. So that's stopping discouragement about the goal. Um, does it land in a way that feels effective or, or do you feel like, meh, I don't know, it doesn't really work. Um, what are your thoughts about that one? Discouragement about the goal um, is completely natural and normal. That's why it's a heading. <laughs> right? That's why it's a heading in the traditional texts, okay? So it's like, don't feel bad about the natural process that's arising. In a way, feel like, oh, wow, I'm so lucky, I'm discouraged. That must mean that I've been working hard up until this point, yeah? If I wasn't discouraged, I must not actually have been taking it seriously, yeah? If I'm not taking it seriously, there's no reason to get discouraged. You're just like, oh, take it or leave it, do it when I like. But if you've actually been working on this for a while, like you all have, like we all have, and you're having a moment of, oh, you know, it actually in a way is a good sign because it's an important developmental stage. Yeah, right in here, okay? So then um, the second point is stopping discouragement about the means to attain the goal. And so the qualm, again, it's in this like debate style. The qualm is, to accomplish Buddhahood, you have to give away your feet, hands, etc. But I'm not capable of such feats. You know, right? Fair enough, right? Like I would like to keep all my limbs. You know, um, if you read the Golden Light Sutra, there's the beautiful chapter about the tigress. And um, the Buddha in one of his previous lives, he comes upon this hungry tigress who is so hungry, she's about to eat her cubs. And his, his heart just bursts open with compassion and he offers himself so that she doesn't eat her own cubs. You know, that's bodhisattva practice, right? But if we saw a hungry tigress who was about to eat her cubs, we would just be really sad about that. We probably wouldn't cut our arm and be like, take me, you know? We just think, ooh, that, wow, that's poignant. Let's see if I can find something to give the tiger, but not me, you know? Or maybe we would think, a good bodhisattva would offer their body. I will offer my body. And we'd like cut our arm and then the tigress would start to eat us. And then we would have regret because we don't actually have strong enough bodhicitta yet. So then, you know, it, that's a sign that it's a bit too soon, bit too soon for us. So we hear these tales and then we just kind of feel really deflated. Like there is no way I'm going to be able to offer my living body to a hungry beast. You know, I just, I can't, I'd freak out. Um, so does that mean I can't be a bodhisattva? And then you're sad. And the reply is, you must bear suffering to that extent for even those who live as they please without engaging in the bodhisattva's deeds, experience as they pass through cyclic existence, unspeakable sufferings, such as having their bodies cut open, torn to pieces, stabs, set on fire and so forth. But they do not accomplish even their own welfare. 
the suffering occasioned by undergoing hardships for the sake of enlightenment is not even a fraction of this suffering and also has a great purpose of accomplishing both your own and others' welfare. So this is just one part, which is basically saying not practicing won't make you avoid suffering, right? So the suffering involved in practicing the spiritual path actually leads to something useful. You could be working your, you could be working and working and working and working and having all sorts of hardship and all sorts of pain and it not ever lead to anything. So why not bear the hardships involved with the spiritual path? Because it actually will lead to something. So that's one part. But then the other part is with respect to giving away your body, you do not give it in the beginning when you are afraid. It says right here, you do not give it when you are afraid. But through graduated training in generosity, you end your attachment to your body. Once you have increased the strength of your great compassion, you have no difficulty when you give it away, provided it's for a great purpose. Right, so you also don't become foolish and say, oh, now I'm just gonna give it to anyone because I've gotten good at generosity, right? It's only if there is a great purpose. So, you know, it's it's an interesting idea because in the Bodhisattva's way of life, they talk about how if a doctor tells you that you have a tumor or you have something that needs to be cut out, you're willing to undergo pain and hardship to get it out. So it's not like we're never able to voluntarily take on suffering if we know it's going to lead to health. Similarly, in the Bodhisattva path, it's like, okay, this heaviness or this discouragement or feeling confused, this is just a suffering that's arising and I'm gonna gradually cut it out of my system, but it's just a part of the path leading to health. It's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, it can build my resilience and my strength. Um, And how many people work far harder than me on the spiritual path, but they work on a non-spiritual path. Yeah, they're working, so many people work so hard, much harder than we work, but what their effort is gonna lead to is something that will finish in this life. And that's incredibly poignant but it also can be very inspiring. You think, wow, they work that hard and it's only for this life. I can work that hard if it's gonna lead to all of this benefit for the future. And if I don't believe in future lives, well, still the ripple effect of my effort is going to go through the people in my life and um, it's gonna have an impact. So you kind of use the fact that people are able to expand a huge amount of effort as an inspiration for us to take that but then apply it to the path. So there's a few different ways of of kind of looking at this, Um, but it's it's basically saying what's happening is normal, don't worry. (laughs) Just how can we use it as a way to kind of fortify ourselves and get some courage? Um, And then it talks about stopping discouragement because wherever you are is a place to practice. Okay, and so this is what a lot of um, people's questions lately have been about like, oh, I can only practice if I'm a monk or a nun, or I can only practice once the kids are grown up, or I can only practice once I'm retired, or I can practice when life is calmer, or I can only practice when, which is a completely normal thought to have because we are, you know, there's a lot of busyness that can distract us from what we want to do. But we want to take this mental habit of whatever is happening is fuel. Whatever is happening is fuel. Happiness is fuel, suffering is fuel. Busyness is fuel, calm is fuel. My whole life, I can feed whatever the content is back into my process of transformation. So, qualm, (laughs) reaching Buddhahood requires taking limitless rebirths in cyclic existence. So I will be harmed by the suffering therein. I'm not capable of such a thing. Reply, reflect as follows. Bodhisattvas have eliminated all negativity and negativity's effect, the feeling of suffering. So it will not arise because they've stopped the cause. Through firm knowledge that cyclic existence lacks an intrinsic nature, like a magician's illusion, they also have no mental suffering. Given that their physical and mental bliss increases, they have no reason to become disheartened, even though they are still in cyclic existence. So it's saying a few things here. And one of them is, if we think about the worst suffering of our life and imagine that we have to keep doing it from now until enlightenment, 
that's a bit tricky. But if we think actually this is the hard part now, it will actually get easier. Yeah, the more we purify the mind, the more we develop our qualities, the path gets easier and easier. So that should kind of reassure us a bit that whatever suffering we're experiencing now, because we're attempting to bring some altruism to it, that means it's exhausting. Yeah, it's finishing itself, right? The, the potency of those negative seeds is burning out and we're creating fewer and fewer of them. Also the positive seeds, which give us temporary happiness, which will lead to ultimate happiness, they're getting more and more of them and they're stronger and stronger. So it's now at this stage before we've realized bodhicitta experientially and directly, this is the hard part. Yeah, and it's going to get easier. Basically, I think the headings are the things to remember, right? The headings are, you know, stopping discouragement about the goal, stopping discouragement about the means, and remembering that everywhere is a place to practice. Yeah, that's the main point of this, this whole section on the laziness of despondency, is that, you know, discouragement is normal. And it's, um, in a way, a good sign that you've been trying hard. Yeah, and it's not going to be forever. It's not going to be forever. And yeah, it will, it'll keep kind of popping up in different forms. Um, you know, the nuns and I talk about this a lot, that they're, the way practice goes, it's kind of like you have a bit of a, a elevated practice in the beginning and then it plateaus and is kind of flat in the same for a while. And then often takes a little dip. <laughs> and then you start going up again for a while and then it plateaus a little dip, you know, and this is kind of how it goes. So there's, there's times where there's obvious progress there's times when progress doesn't seem to be happening very much, but you're holding steady. And then there's times when you kind of backslide a little bit. Yeah, and then when you pull yourself out of that actually is, is about the beginning of the next increase. So often when things are the hardest is kind of um, the sign that you're just about to go to kind of your next level of practice if you can move through it. That point of resistance is a, often a transition point. So, um, Anyway, the, um, the first few times it hits you, it's, it's really confronting, and then you start to get used to it as quite a normal part of the practice and actually meaning that something wonderful is going to be at the end of it. Um, yeah. Questions or thoughts about that? Do you, do you have any more, um, you know, kind of things to flesh out about the, the laziness section? Any? Um, I don't know, insights or doubts about it before we move on to the next section. Um, it's, a, it's a really important section, um, but it's intellectually pretty easy to understand. I'm just wondering how the application of this information is going. Um, it deals a lot with the gap between the goal and where you are. And Last, last uh, uh, lesson, you, saw, you said something about uh, the narcissistic, the grandiosity area of it. But the gap itself is important not only because of that. I mean, it's just sometimes not connected as much when there is such a huge gap. Okay, like, and a lot of what you say is um, also learn from the way you are right now, what helps you right now and having it much closer to where you are because it is actually working. So it's again, it's the same discussion I have every time that you want some inspiration and you need that and there are times you do need the inspiration, but sometimes the, um, the goal is um, described in a way which is in our sense, like it's not experienced near in the way that it's not like, well, not next month going to happen. And you like, you need the inspiration, I need the inspiration in a um, more accessible way. The, for example, I can give you an example of such an inspiration. The way you describe your teacher is such an inspiration because for you, he's right now an inspiration. Right now, the way you see him right now is already something that you can touch, you feel it. Okay, so he is an inspiration by himself for you. Okay, so this is a very experienced near insp inspiration. It's not a, some 
idea it is connected to idea and to knowledge. And I feel that all those kind of things which are hands-on that, that you can feel are very, very important. And for me personally, more important uh, on also such moments in life than um, uh, what will happen in endless uh, reincarnations. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that 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 you know experience near immediate connection <clears throat> is vital. It's why we need the guru. But that wouldn't be enough unless you had an idea of a goal. You know, so it's not like you're neglecting the fact that there is somewhere that you want to be going with this. But then you kind of like, okay, that's where I'm going. But who knows how long it'll take? Certainly, as you said, not this month. Um, and then you take the real time example of what inspires you in this moment. But um, if that can inspire you in this moment in a larger, deeper sense, then, you know, today is going to be happier, but it's also going to lead to something. You know, you could just be kind of momentarily inspired and have a momentary good day, but it's not going to have the same continuity and link day to day to day. Then you wind up on your deathbed feeling like you've li lived a meaningful life. You know, you have more just chapters and pockets of inspiration rather than a link between each day. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you want to meet my teacher, you can just go to Australia once the travel ban's over. But, um, <laughs> you know, um, but there are people like that who are going to resonate for us. And, and I think it is important to try and um, link up with them in some way, even if, you know, it's someone like His Holiness who you don't see in person that often, but, you know, who teaches live and you can, you know, see live streams and, you know, we can visit him in Dharamsala, you know, once the travel ban's over. And, you know, people that you can see in person, it's, it's so normal. And, you know, a lot of us do these once a year giant retreats with Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Um, and then we go back to normal, right? Then we go back to our normal life with our normal Geshe, you know, who usually t teaches in a very traditional structured points logical way. But if we only do that, sometimes it can get a little bit dry, especially if we're busy and we're not applying it. So then once a year, we go to a big retreat, you know, for a month or a week or whatever with Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who is not linear, who does not teach by an outline who often makes no sense whatsoever, but is very inspiring, right? He's a very, very inspiring person, not for everyone. For some people, he seems like a madman. But, um, you know, if you can find someone like that who it's not really about the content, it's about the inspiration, that can be really useful. And, you know, it's not like he's the only one or, you know, if you don't connect with him, then you're lost. It's like there's tons of beings like that who just when they teach, you really don't know a lot of what they're talking about, and it's a little bit hard to follow. And yet, at the end of the class, you feel so lifted and so connected to your path. Um, it becomes a much less um, verbally conceptual experience with some teachers. It's like it helps integrate all of the wordy conception and all of the outliney stuff. It helps kind of like, I don't know, pour nectar all over the top of it, you know, so it shines. Yeah, and so I often think of that, that some teachers are like building the scaffolding and the framework for me to lift myself with. And then some teachers are, you know, pouring this nectar all over the top of it and making it shine and happy, you know, and some teachers can do both and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I think a real life example is, is important. Um, and it just requires a bit of planning. You know, it requires a bit of planning and a bit of um, getting yourself organized and, you know, make it happen. Life's short. Yes, I don't know. I don't know if it's a comment, a question or both or just a thought. But uh, what I hear very strong in your, in your words, and I think it's a common theme for all the, the, theme, the three laziness and for, for all our practice in a sense, especially in this moment, is renunciation again and again in all those complex forms and uh, where where renunciation is uh, is helping us to to develop our practice and develop our mind and where renunciation is uh, uh, can be a situation of um, discouragement or depression or nothing i think that renunciation is the great the great title which resonates in my mind Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I, it makes me happy to hear you describe it that way, because it, it can be a topic that feels um, kind of 
you know, heavy when in fact it's freedom, you know, connecting with renunciation is connecting with the potential for freedom. It's like you were, you know, in your, in your prison trying to make it comfortable and now suddenly you discovered a window and you can look out of it and see all there is outside of it and you start chipping away at the walls and it's like, now you can see outside, it's so joyful. Before you were just trying to make do with the prison, you know, yeah. It's a, it is a joyful topic, renunciation, but it, it is a little confronting as well, for sure. Yeah, yeah other, other thoughts about obstacles to energy or these, these types of laziness? I want to say that I know that the spiritual way is, uh, is different than this uh, psychoanalytical one, and maybe not the way we're trying to hold it together. But we do have the term uh, well analyzed, whatever it means. But um, I, I think that every and uh, each of, uh, one of us knows what um, when we're in psycho, in, we're uh, in analysis, uh, if we're lazy about it, and if we're not lazy about it, and the. Uh, the inspiration and the intention and the encouragement to go on on our analysis in, in to be better analyzed or well analyzed. It's not so different in um, the motivation and in the hard work and in uh, sticking to, you know, to the path as is in our spiritual practice. And actually, you know, we'll try to combine them. But um, I think we know the notion. Yeah, you know the notion, and yeah, that's, and I think even, you know, separate from uh, Buddhism or psychoanalysis, there's something just in our human lived experience that understands the notion too. I think also there's something in there. Um, it's just, I think it is useful to, to put a heading or put a framework around these things and to, you know, define them and then let go of the definition. But to, to land somewhere and to kind of tidy it up and look at the edges and the borders of it, even if once you do that, then the borders dissolve, it gives it more power and it can um, fuel progress. And so, so sort of taking this kind of like background wisdom that we have and these background understandings and feelings and experiences and kind of pulling them forefront intentionally, tidying them up, examining them, and then feeding them back to ourselves. I think it can be really useful. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, again, you don't have to remember all the lists of things, but try and try and think of them at least while we're talking about them and for a few days after. And then if you let it go, that's fine because it's still in there somewhere digesting and brewing. Um, but, um, you know, don't feel like the, the points are the main thing. It's, it's the truth that you're touching because of them. Yeah. Look ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's similar to how you try to transmit any kind of wisdom to someone else. I mean, it's natural, isn't it? It's, it's really a natural thing to do. You probably even notice I am talking more than I normally talk, you know, um, there's less, um, you know, space to just kind of sit with points because there's this whole new format of video and there's this whole, you know, it's a whole different way of being and we're just trying to figure out what's going to make things connect and land. And so, so first I think, you know, just give yourself a bit of a break and that you're just adjusting to this new normal. Um, but then second to remember that um, the wisdom you've learned is born from a great deal of thought. And they, they are trying to catch up when you're bombarding them with wisdom. They are, they're trying to hurry to catch up to what you're saying. And you can't inject them with your whole process of thought that led you to your conclusions. So what you can do is model it, you know, model it and transform, you know, transfer it by your being. 
and then see if you can find openings to bring it out of them to see what of that they already know themselves. But, but I think it's similar to how you normally would be in, in analysis trying to transmit anything. It, it's it's got to be a very um, deeply empathic experience. But yeah, Renan probably explained much better. <laughs> oh, just to use this contribution order to add something to the question of laziness of the, uh, of, of the, of the mind. Uh, what you, are, what you are raising, Smadar, is a working through piece of work. You are understanding that you try to reduce your anxiety by being active. It's not something that you are doing with him, it's something that you are doing with yourself at this exact moment. So this is a moment of laziness of the mind because we are in the illusion that action will reduce anxiety more than broadening the mind. And while you are asking it concerning the patient, how can I be more empathetic with them? First of all, we have to transform something which is quenched by uh, our anxiety or any other things that is uh, narrowing the mind. So it's very, it's very easily understand, understood what does it mean, laziness, even if it's a term or a word that was uh, once uh, termed in this sense. But the laziness is, for, for example, that we prefer action on mentality. And when Coat, in some of his Chicago lectures, talked about the future mind, he thought about a mind that wouldn't need any action at all. And maybe the future life, the future, uh, the future global uh, evolution of the human mind wouldn't be relying so much on action, but much more on the widening and broadening of the mind. And, you know, I think touching stillness in the face of your own agitation and in the face of someone else's agitation is just our continuous project. You know, it's a continuous project of just touching that inner stillness, clarity, you know, a good old fashioned clarity of mind meditation that you all know. Um, you know, successful or unsuccessful doesn't really matter. Just doing it before you go into a session or your series of sessions um, reminds you that there is always space and there always is reflective ability and clarity and the rest is just kind of noise on the top. And if you can do that clarity of mind meditation with the bodhicitta motivation, you're, you're gonna be set up quite well for a couple hours, I think. And then you might have to recalibrate and retune in a break time to just make sure you haven't lost yourself back into the you know, whirlwind of busyness around you and within you. But even if there's a, a whirlwind within you, there's like the eye of the storm where things are calm. You know, and so touching back into that, you don't have to change the storm or change the tornado. It can just keep being a little tornado in there. You don't have to defeat it, but just kind of move through it to the center of it where there's still a place of clarity and calm and try to communicate from that space and to try and overcome the tendency to communicate from that space always in words. You know, it seems only natural to do it in words, especially if you can't do it as easily energetically as you can face to face. But remember that the mind is not actually trapped by the confines of the body. That, you know, you can have a friend overseas and be thinking of them all day and then they will magically call you. You know, this has happened probably to us all the time. Um, you know, are you thinking of them all day and then there's an email pops in. Um, you know, we feeling each other all the time. And, and so to also take some faith in that, that you can communicate a lot, even if you're not face to face, you're just very focused. Yeah, and it might be that you have to focus a bit more because they're not in the same room with you than you do normally, because just by being in the same room, it's a bit easier, the flow. And also you can read the body language and respond to that and, re you know, respond to their own voice in a different way when there's, uh, you know, the video cuts in and out and there's audio distortion and you're not sure if you're reading the body language that they're having now or two seconds ago and all of that, that can really be very distracting, um, you know, and it's, it's hard. And so give yourself a break and um, give them a break and just kind of, what am I communicating? Heart to heart, heart to heart. That's the main thing, you know, just kind of like flood the space with compassion. It'll work out better.
but yeah, I think, you know, talk, talk amongst yourselves about this too, because I'm guessing everyone's in the same boat. Um, yeah. And remember the things you already know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, that seems really skillful, right? And, and, you know, just, there's no need to deceive them about what's happening. It won't work anyway. Just, you know, name it. I got off center by that thing that happened, you know, or I, I, I lost my way for a second there. Sorry, I'm back. You know, just, I don't know. You guys know how to do this. I think remind yourself that you know how to do this. It's just a different situation is um, making us doubt ourselves a little bit. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm similar. I have to do all these classes online with you guys and with other people and small groups and big groups. And, you know, sometimes I overthink it and I think, oh, what should I do that's, oh, right, just do what I normally do, right? Do that, <laughs> just try to do it well. I don't have to do a new thing, um, you know, so kind of come back to some faith in yourself that you do know what you're doing. It's just operating through a different conduit um, and allow for some adjustment time. You know, and yeah, and keep your sense of humor and, and know that it's going to be a bit awkward and a bit clunky, you know, in the beginning as you're adjusting. And that's probably good for all of our humility and, um, you know, just, yeah, don't lose your sense of humor. It is, it, it, it's totally confronting. So yeah, I, I hear you with the, it's a bit awkward and it triggers all our eight worldly concerns. And um, you know, I'm right there with you. And I was like, oh, look at my face, I'm so pink. Oh my goodness, oh, you know, all the vanity kind, kind of comes up and um, you know, oh, I should sit up straight, stop fidgeting, Yintin. You know, like it all comes up for all of us. And you know, it's an opportunity to find the object of negation, <laughs> right? So um, we're with you. With you. So we'll, um, we'll go ahead and finish. And um, again, if you want to look at His Holiness's text, um, the, the 37 practices of a Bodhisattva, and just look at the couple of verses that we've gone through already and just kind of see um, his presentation, the more traditional presentation, see how it lands. And um, yeah, see you soon. Oh, Ranan, yeah. Just to share that uh, yesterday at uh, midnight exactly, I listened to the Tara meditation and I want to thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. I well. recommend on it every night. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a good opportunity to record things that I've been meaning to do for a while. And then, you know, a lot of the people overseas are like, yay. <laughs> so um, thanks for pushing me. It's good. Good. Okay. So we'll just take a minute and, um, let everything integrate as much as it can and just sit with what can we pull into the rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.